Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the MEGIT webinar. We will begin in approximately three minutes. Thank you for joining today's webinar on test setup verification. We will begin in one minute. Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Sinan Kanatsis. As CEO of KCOM, it is my pleasure to welcome you to MEGIT's third in a series of webinars on transducer uses and best practices. In this webinar, we will discuss best practices to verify a test setup incorporating accelerometers, pressure transducers, electronics, and cables. This may be defined as a simplified measurement chain. Before introducing our presenters, I would like to ask a question of the audience. Do you verify your setup before beginning tests or considering an installation complete? Please vote now. And if you answered, it depends, feel free to use the questions functionality to let us know which factors help you decide whether or not to undertake verification procedures. Please take the next moment to answer the question. Fifteen more seconds. Validating the signal path from the transducer to the data acquisition system can try the patience of any test engineer, but every testing professional has a varied suite of validation methods, some rather unique. To verify a transducer's location and functionality along the entire measurement chain, a thorough and exhaustive review of any one of these methods could consume more than the time allowed for this webinar. We intend to briefly illustrate several validation methodologies and indicate which transducers and scenarios they are appropriate. A PDF of this presentation will be offered at the conclusion of the webinar including contact information for our experts to allow for more in-depth conversations about these practices. Now I'd like to introduce our facilitators. Tim Hardin is an applications engineer 
with over 25 years of experience in customer support for transducer applications. Ray Rautenstrock brings more than a decade of dynamic measurement experience. After the test methodologies are presented, Tim and Ray will take your questions. You are welcome to submit them throughout the presentation by clicking on Ask a Question. Tim, why don't you start us off? Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this webinar, so let's begin. Many tests require transducer setup verification to ensure the data is valid, is accurate, and meets the scope of a test definition. Test setup verification is needed to detect and correct potential problems before pressing the test button. A typical list of verifications may include detecting a wrong channel, verify intact cabling and data acquisition, transducer location, transducer polarity, gain, scaling, filtering, sensitivity, and more. Verification of the entire measurement chain is necessary before running expensive tests, making it possible to correct mistakes and creating confidence in the transducer performance before beginning expensive and unrepeatable tests. At this point, I would like to take a quick poll from the audience. Sometimes the sheer number of channels makes it daunting to consider verifying each channel. However, it is often these tests that would be the most expensive to repeat and make the best case for undertaking such a project. Please take the time and tell me the number of channels you have ever installed for a test or permanent monitoring installation by selecting the appropriate range on your screen. Vote now and we'll pause for a few moments to let everyone participate. The first validation test method is a 2G turnover test, which verifies the entire system and is accomplished by sim simply flipping over a low-range transducer and allowing it to be held in Earth's gravity to take one reading, then turning it over 180 degrees in the sensitive axis to take the second reading. This equals a 2G difference between the two readings as depicted in the photos that you see on the screen. This will validate that the transducer is connected appropriate signal conditioning is being used, and the expected gain is set up for the measurement. Ray, do you have any input on this? Yes, Tim, thank you. As you mentioned, some high G transducers may not be tested at all by performing this 2G turnover test because the transducer's output is just too low. Additionally, this test method may require the sensor to be unmounted from the test structure, perform the 2G test, and then remount it again. This might be time consuming. Performing this particular test method may be best performed before final mounting. Another test method may be performed while the transducer is in its final mounted location. This is called the tap test. The tap test is very common. It's important to understand that the tapping is not done by hitting the accelerometer. The tap test is accomplished by tapping the structure near the transducer. The tap test will ensure the connectivity of the transducer, the signal conditioning, and the data system involved in the test. This is a quick test method that checks the end-to-end -end of the measurement chain. What do you think, Tim? Ray, I agree that hitting the accelerometer itself can be destructive, but the tap test method near the accelerometer is one of the most frequent tests performed, and it requires two or more people, which can be labor intensive. It does not validate amplitude or gain settings because of the uncalibrated tap, and if there are multiple accelerometers near the tapping location, multiple measurements will be registered from the same tapping point. Here's a test method that addresses some of these challenges, which is called channel illumination. In this case, it is a visual test method for a mounted transducer's location. Ch channel illumination is a new validation method based on Megat's patent-pending channel light that solves some of the problems of tap test. It is designed to enable a single test technician the ability to verify the location of an individual accelerometer in a multi-channel vibration test without leaving the control room. 
This is performed by activating the channel light within the data acquisition system. For example, on the screen is a data physics quattro. Uh, it allows the test technician to electrically reverse bias the LED through software. As you see, the six inch integral cable device is compatible with TEDS or non-TEDS transducers, including IEPE accelerometers and other IEPE modules. The channel light is inserted between the accelerometer and the normal coax cable, as it features a male and female connector. An integral LED light identifies the transducer's location. The main benefit of the channel light is that it eliminates the need to disconnect uh, cables or to touch the transducer to verify the location of individual accelerometers. Verification should take seconds rather than minutes per channel. Data Physics has updated their software and their Quattro data acquisition unit to be compatible with the channel light, making them the first data acquisition company to enable the channel illumination technology with a single click of a mouse. Ray, do you have any thoughts on this new test method? This is an excellent test method, Tim. I believe it's been one of those points of channel verification that have been missing from industry. Any single test method does not validate everything in a sensor uh, measurement chain, but channel illumination is an easy method to determine the mounted location of an accelerometer. For instance, in most large channel tests, all the same color wiring is used. A misplacement of a wire from position B to position C uh, is very difficult to troubleshoot. This channel illumination method really helps out with that. However, this does not check the validity of the transducer itself. It's just an easy method to know which cable, which channel is connected to which sensor location. Let's talk more about validating the transducer itself. For example, ZMO, or zero measure into output measurement, provides a good health check for a variable capacitive or piezo-resistive transducer. This measurement requires the attached signal conditioner to have this ability. Simply measure the transducer's ZMO and compare it to the value on the transducer's data sheet or calibration certificate. Any transducer out of tolerance should be considered for replacement. Depending on the signal conditioner being used, the methods to do this test may be different in setup. For example, the Megat Model 136 signal conditioner can be set up with the auto zero turned off and the ZMO can be measured at the output of the signal conditioner or by the data system. This directly tests the transducer itself along with the immediate measurement chain. Tim, would you like to expand on this? Well, Ray, I might add that the ZMO is the unbalanced output of a transducer, meaning that there's some imbalance in the bridge itself, which is very common. This test method also does not verify the transducer's location, filtering, or any transducer with bad ZMO, which is uh, a critical imbalance in the bridge resistance. A more thorough test of the bridge can be accomplished with the following test. Measuring input and output resistance is a great method to verify a healthy transducer. This requires the transducer's output connector be available for measurement with an ohmmeter. This resistance measurement is made at the first available connection point to the transducer. The resulting values are compared to the transducer's data sheet and any out of tolerance measurement should be considered for replacement. This is a true health check. It will tell you that there is possibly a cracked or open bridge as well as any alteration for the transducer's original resistance. This is an easy method to check integrity of the transducer. Right, Ray? Yes, very much. Excellent point. This is a very good test method, and I personally recommend it often to test lab professionals. We do need to remember it does not check the integrity of the signal conditioning or data system. It's only validating the transducer itself. This does not this does take a bit of time in some cases to disconnect and measure the bridge resistance of a previously installed transducer. Similar to the 2G turnover, this is probably best done before final installation. We can consider another test method by exciting 
the entire measurement chain. Tim, do you foresee any downsides to this verification setup? So in order to excite the total measurement chain, using a calibrated excitation source, such as a handheld shaker, this is a very accurate method for complete end-to-end -end system verification. For example, a 1G shaker will excite an accelerometer at a known amplitude. This will verify the transducer sensitivity, sensitivity settings in the data system, as well as any other system setups. As seen in the graph, Specialized handheld shakers, such as the Megat Reference Mate, can vary frequencies. This will help validate system setup where integration or double integration is being done. And this way the system is reporting a value, value of one, which is very easily calculated. This directly verifies the, sense, the accelerometer's integrity, the signal conditioning, and any gain applied in the system setup. One important validation I'd like, like is of the accelerometer's calibration itself. Tim, any thoughts on this? Well, Ray, all I can add is this test method sometimes is impractical since it requires the transducer to be detached from the test structure and mounted on a vibration source but it may be the best test method to verify the complete system for non-repeatable test. Another good ver verification or validation test method is voltage signal simulation. Voltage signal simulation is accomplished by introducing a known voltage and known frequency into the system. This signal path verification test is used to prove the entire cabling from the transducer all the way to the data acquisition system. Voltage simulation can be accomplished in many ways, from as simple as connecting a battery to the input leads of the cable, or by using a more complicated and thorough test method with the use of a function generator or handheld signal source. A function generator or handheld signal source allows the use of a calibrated signal that varies both in amplitude and frequency. This is a more thorough method that can be used to verify gain, scaling settings, and even the filter roll-off values for each channel. This is a very good system verification test method for a voltage output transducer. But remember, with other test methods, the transducer itself can be verified as well. Other simulation methods can be done for IEPE devices. Signal simulation of an IEPE device must also simulate the load associated with the constant current provided, truly simulating the IEPE transducer circuit. This is frequently done to ensure there is enough constant current to drive the high frequency signals of interest down the measurement chain. Specialized devices like the Mega 4830B will provide a known amplitude up to 20 kilohertz, which can many times provide out-of-band frequencies to ensure proper system low-pass filtering is enabled. This test method validates the measurement chain, the gain settings, and the filtering of the system. In the example on the screen, a known input was simulated into the system. Clipping can be seen on the top graph. Simply in this case, the data system was set up with an improper gain. This was easily corrected and test it again. Before the actual test, the system was able to be validated and the proper measurement would be able to be made. Tim, would you like to take this further for charge mode piezoelectric transducers? Certainly, Ray. We can perform a similar test method for charge simulation and insert in place of the piezoelectric accelerometers. MEGAT incorporates the functionality as well in the 4830B for both single-ended and differential piezoelectric accelerometers. The handheld unit simulates the output in charge mode accelerometer and picocoulombs for complete channel setup. The signal is adjustable in frequency and in amplitude, making it a very dynamic test that can identify channel noise 
as well as verifying out-of-band frequencies to ensure appropriate filtering is enabled. Any other That's comments, true. right? Yes, that is true. All of these simulation methods are great for system setup verification. Now let's talk more about validating the tr transducer itself. For instance, shunt calibration. Shunt calibration can be performed as another verification test for piezo-resistive transducers channel setup, gain setting, and proper cable connection. Shunt calibration is a physical connection of a calibrated resistance value across one non-active Wheatstone bridge leg. Some transducers have internal shunt resistors installed for quick and easy testing. Shunt calibration is a simple and potentially accurate means of simulating action of a strain gauge. Tim, you've performed these tests. Would you like to share some of these thoughts? Certainly, Ray. This is sometimes a complex procedure since some transducers do not have fixed resistors built into them, so it has to be done externally with special equipment. Even some signal conditioners do not allow this test method. So I think it is best to sidebar this topic and let the audience email us with their specific questions that we can answer at a later date. This is our last verification test method, and it applies to pressure transducers. Piezo-resistive pressure transducers operate on a similar principle to piezo-resistive piezo accelerometers, since they are essentially the same Wheatstone bridge design. For absolute pressure transducer, one simple test method is to obtain the current barometric pressure from a local weather station and compare it to the reading out of your data acquisition system. And that's because an absolute pressure transducer is referenced to a vacuum, so the output is the current barometric pressure. For both absolute and gauge pressure transducers, a simple dynamic test method is to apply both positive and negative pressures to the sensing portion of the unit. While a syringe is the preferred method of creating pressure, it is possible to do this using simple tubing and creating pressure from your mouth. What do you think, Ray? I actually like this test method because it's so seemingly simple. The only challenge may be in some installations where a tube or a syringe cannot get to the mounted transducer. So this test for, to validate functionality of the pressure sensor itself may be done before final mounting in its measurement location. We have covered actually several different types of test methods throughout this presentation. Some are new and some are unique. You've probably noticed that no one measurement test method checks every link in the transducer measurement chain. Each method has pros and cons that make it best. For your specific application, it's all about understanding the different test capabilities and constraints and matching them to your needs. In this presentation, we hope to give you a sampling and enough information to begin to decide which techniques and tools will best validate your test system setup. Tim and my email addresses are provided so that you can contact us directly for more information. Sinan, would you like to take it from here? Yes, thank you. And thank you to our facilitators for your time today. At this time, we'll open up the floor to questions, beginning with some that were submitted throughout the presentation today. Uh, please be sure to access the Q&A module at the bottom of your screen to just simply ask a question to our presenters. Looks like a few questions have already come in. Um, we'll just kind of open it up, Tim and Ray. Uh, the first question is, does your channel light work directly with piezoelectric accelerometers? Let's see, Ray, I'll take that one if you don't mind. Not at all. For the channel light, it does not, it does not uh, interface directly to piezoelectric accelerometers. It must require an IEPE device. The IEPE device does not have to have TEDs, but it must be IEPE to allow the, the TEDs portion to work inside the channel light. So I hope this answers your question. Again, if it does not, please contact me after this webinar. Uh, can I perform shunt calibration for a VC accelerometer? Uh, 
I can take a stab at it right here. You want me to take it? I can take this one. Shunt calibration on a VC6 accelerometer can be accomplished as long as the variable capacitive accelerometer does not have internal amplification. So you do need to directly get to the Wheatstone bridge configuration. Tim, feel free to add any comments. Well, it's not easily done because uh, this device is variable capacitance. It uh, does not have uh, fixed resistors to go across. So actually, Ray, it's not possible to do a uh, shunt calibration for a variable capacitance accelerometer. That's great. Thank you, Tim. No problem. Great. Uh, next question is, I have a piezo-resistive accelerometer with four active gauges. Can I perform shunt calibration? I'll take that one as well, Ray, if you don't mind. It's very similar to the variable capacitance. As you, as it's stated here, it has four active gauges, which means all gauges are varying. You can perform shunt cal on it, but it will not be active because you do not know the resistance at the time you're doing the shunt cal. So it would not be an accurate calibration. So yes, you can do it. However, it would not be accurate because it's not a fixed resistor and it, the outcome would be unknown. Another question. I like your reference uh, meet handheld shaker, but I need more frequencies than three. This is Ray. There are shakers available. Uh, Mega provides portable shaker systems with adjustable frequencies so you can set your own, as well as sh shakers that stand alone. In those cases where you need more frequencies or want to adjust your frequencies, those are areas to investigate. Ray, I might add to that that um, the, the model number that I just wanted to add that the model number for that is a 28959. It is a portable shaker calibrator as well. So it is portable and it can be moved from place to place. It's battery operated and you can vary the frequency and amplitude. That's all I have. Great. Another question has come in. Um, we use a Ruska calibrated pressure controller to check functionality and also to verify and calculate the in situ sensitivity of our Indevco differential unsteady pressure sensor by applying a reference pressure to the reference tube. What is your opinion of this process and are there any drawbacks? Well, I'm not too familiar with the Ruska calibrated pressure controller system itself. However, applying a steady state pressure to the pressure transducer is, is a good test method to validate sensitivity and functionality of the pressure transducer. It does not check the frequency response of the sensor itself. However, uh, it's a very good test method. Another question has just come in. When the transducer measurement 5 MV and not use, I need calibrate D receptor or D transducer. 5 megavolt. Unfortunately, I'm not able to understand the exact nature of the question. So this is Tim Harden. If you would email me your question, I would like to have a dialogue with you to better understand your application, and then I can answer your question in detail. So Tim Harden, yes, we'll be Tim.Harden at Megat.com. Yep. You got it. Uh, another question has come in. What is your opinion of shunt calibration versus actual calibration of bridge type pressure transducers? Which is more valid? That's a good question. Tim, would you like to comment on that? No problem, right? Uh, let me scroll back down to see the question again. Where did it go? Bear with me it's, a second while uh, I find the question. Yeah, sure. All right, now I've got it. Had to scroll around a bit. Apologize for that. My opinion of shunt calibration versus actual calibration of a bridge type pressure transducer. Our pressure transducers are uh, full bridge, 
all active elements, so shunt calibration is not an option. And again, it's not really true calibration when you're doing a, but I guess a misnomer, shunt cal is not really a calibration. You're not calibrating the transducer. What you're doing is putting a resistance value, which is known, across one leg of the bridge that is a fixed leg, and that value is known. So that provides your data acquisition system to have a specific offset. So you're actually checking and verifying that, one, the transducer is good for that leg, two, that you're getting a true signal to your data acquisition system. It's actually no, no uh, shunt calibration is not doing any type of calibration to the actual transducer itself. So that's really a misnomer. Again, if you have questions, please send me an email. Great. That looks to be the last question. And as a reminder, again, we will be sure to uh, send a follow-up thank you to our audience as well as copy this presentation. And uh, would like to just really thank Ray and Tim for sharing today. And uh, would like to encourage our audience to participate in our exit poll. Let us know which future webinar you would like to attend. So that question will be coming up right this second. If you could just take uh, 15 seconds to answer this and then we will conclude our webinar for today. Thank you very much on behalf of Megat uh, for joining us today.